you. Thank you very much. Do you want me on the stage or is this okay for you guys? All right, you comfortable with this? I'm comfortable with this. I'm Gary Hebel. I'm state representative. You live in the 46th assembly district. There's 99 total assembly, uh, assembly districts. I grew up here in Sun Prairie and uh, I went to school at uh, Sun Prairie uh, Schools. Uh, went to uh, law, uh, undergraduate school at UW-Madison. Uh, graduated there in political science and then went to law school at uh, Gonzaga Law School in Spokane, Washington, where I became a, uh, a lawyer and have been practicing law here in Sun Prairie since 1976. So that's, I'm in my 37th year. So I think I'm old enough to be your, maybe your grandfather. It's scary how fast that goes, but uh, Sun Prairie is, is my home. I feel very fortunate to be able to represent uh, the city of Sun Prairie uh, in the state legislature. Um, some unusual facts about me, I'm a, uh, I come from a family of uh, 17 children. I'm one of 17. So I didn't have much say in that, uh, but I was uh, very happy that uh, my parents decided to have a big family, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Uh, I'll tell you their names. Uh, I've been in the legislature for eight years, and you're all juniors or seniors, so some of you may have come to the Capitol when you were in fourth grade. And did any of you uh, tour the Capitol when you were in fourth grade? Was I there when you were there? Did I tell you my siblings' names? I probably, should I tell the rest of these people my siblings' names? I'll do that real quick. I have 17 in the family, so their names are Frank, Bill, Judy, Bob, Jim, Tom, Fred, John, Gary, Mary, Paul, Pat, Joe, Jane, Lynn, Jack, and Jeffrey. So some people don't believe that I came from a family of 17. That's one way to prove it. And so I'm actually out of 17. Any of you middle children? Okay. The rest of you are either the oldest or the youngest in your family. I am the epitome of the middle child. In my family, I have eight siblings older than me, eight siblings younger than me. So I am in the middle. They, they say the middle child is shortchanged. So if any, anybody here is a middle child, you know what I'm talking about. And I must have really got shortchanged. But frankly, I don't believe I did. Uh, the legislature that I serve in has 99 members. I'm one of 99 in the Wisconsin State Legislature. I represent approximately 60,000 people. Sun Prairie is about 30,000, so that's half my district. I also have the uh, village of Cottage Grove and the city of Stoughton, and that totals about 60,000 people. How did I ever get into the legislature, and why would I ever want to do that? Well, as you grow, first of all, you're doing the right thing by going to high school, but education is absolutely the most important thing that you can do to get ahead in this world. With education, there are so many doors that will open for you that you would otherwise not be able to go through. And speaking of doors, there's this thing called opportunity. And when opportunity knocks, you want to be ready to answer that door and find out what's on the other side. Because in, in life, Things don't always happen the way you plan them. You have to always be ready for an opportunity that you never, ever expected. Well, in my life, my brother Tom, he and I are lawyers together here in Sun Prairie, and we have the firm of Hebel, Hebel, and Rip. And we've done that for, as I said, 37 years. Uh, Tom has done it a year longer than I am. He's six years older than I am, and he was the legislator from this district for four terms before I was elected. And what happened with Tom was that he was in the assembly for uh, eight years and then there was a seat that opened in the Senate. The Senate is the higher house and there's only 33 members of that, uh, the Senate. So every senator represents three assembly districts. So Tom decided to run for the Senate. And he ran against Mark Miller, who you'll meet in one of the upcoming sessions. 
and Tom won two of the three assembly districts, but not the one in Monona, which was, had the highest voter turnout. So when Tom decided to run for the Senate, I told my wife, I said, Lynn, there's an opportunity for me. There's a door that's knocking, and I could open that and get in the, the assembly if I wanted to do that. Because name recognition, the fact that Tom had the seat and having the same last name of Hebel, would allow me an easier chance to become the representative in the assembly. My wife said, great, let's go for it. We'll do the best we can, and, and let's see if we can get elected. Well, fortunately for me, uh, I was elected and have been the representative for the last eight years. Now, before that, when I was in college in political science, I had a professor named Leon Epstein. And you're going to find that in high school, you know, there's, there's certain teachers that you really, really do well with. They really make an impression upon you that you want to emulate them. They're good mentors. That's what's going to happen in life, and that's, I'm sure, what's happened to you in high school. There's one or two or maybe five teachers that have really gone beyond the call and really done, done things for you to make your life or your decision-making process much easier. That's true also in college. And Leon Epstein was one of those professors. He was a professor of American government. And we talked one day about getting into politics. And Professor Epstein said, there's two things I want you to know about if you're going to run, run, for, politics, run for office. Number one, everything that you do if you're running for political office is you live in a glass bowl, so everything you do is under scrutiny. People are going to look at you and say, you're doing this or that or whatever you do, they're going to scrutinize it much more severely than any standard citizen. Well, I don't know. That didn't excite me very much. I don't want people scrutinizing my life. And the second thing he said was that every decision that you make, there's going to be people that do not agree with you. They're, they not only disagree, but they may be vehemently opposed to your decision. Well, you know, it's nice to be popular. It's nice to have people agree with you, but there also is that part of politics or decision making where you have to stand up for what you believe in, even though it may not be popular or everybody may not agree in it with it. Now you may have seen in the Star a couple weeks ago, they had the opening for Woodman's. And they had a pitch on the front page. There were only two protesters at the, at the, at the whole event. I didn't even know they were there. But the pitch on the front page had two protesters. And these two protesters are Dick and Dottie Rohde. I know them. I've talked to them. Actually, they used to learn suburban photography. And uh, we actually got our class pictures when I was in high school from them. But they were real upset about the um, uh, high-speed rail. And I was in favor of high-speed rail. And they were not. And I think they live near the railroad track, but I'm not sure. But they were protesting that decision of mine. Ultimately, the high-speed rail did not come through. Our governor, current governor, said that uh, it would cost too much to maintain it. I, I disagreed with that because I really wanted jobs in the state, and so I felt that we would have gotten a lot of jobs. And Wisconsin would be a better place with a high-speed rail. Just one issue among many. But what happens when you make a decision, you have to live with the consequences of that decision. And that was a decision that you know, I, I felt right about high-speed rail. I think look into the future and, and make sure that Wisconsin is on the cutting edge. Now, with regards to my, my platform, what issues are important to me as a legislator? The number one issue that I feel is absolutely the number one factor for any legislature is to make sure that we as a legislature, as a state, provide the best quality education that we can for our students. You are the future of Wisconsin. As you sit here, what you accomplish, what you learn, what you do, will determine the success of the state of Wisconsin during your generation. 
and the next generation will also be responsible for their part in making Wisconsin, our country, the greatest in the world. And I think Wisconsin is the best state in the nation. I really believe that. I'm not, I'm not just saying that because I represent Wisconsin, but I believe that it is. Now, we've taken some hits with regards to education. So this last session, I was not real happy with the cuts that we had to education. But my number one priority is to make sure that you get the best quality education that you can. You're really fortunate to live in Sun Prairie. I don't know if you know this, but this high school was paid for by a referendum that the citizens of this school district decided to vote in favor of. It cost over $95 million. That's the highest referendum that has ever passed in the state of Wisconsin. So obviously the citizens of your community, of Sun Prairie, our community, believe in education. Another th uh, point to look at in Sun Prairie is that I always can tell the quality of life in a community by the quality of their library. Now you know that our library in Sun Prairie, the public library, is second to none. It cost, I believe, five over $5 million. And there were private donations to that library of almost half of that amount. So citizens in Sun Prairie went in their own pocket and came up with over $2 million to make sure that our library was not just the run of the mill, but it was absolutely the best library that it could be. So education is crucial to the success of any society, and it's crucial to the success that you will have in your life. And so I will fight very hard to make sure that our funding for education at the state level is at its highest amount that we can possibly come up with, because it's that important to me. Other issues that are important to me are jobs. One of the things that here in, in Wisconsin that we need, you guys need jobs. How many are working right now? Wonderful. Anybody working at the uh, at Costco or well, Costco's not open yet, but Costco or Woodman's? Anybody working at Woodman's? Great. Woodman's is uh, it's nice to get that paycheck, which is a little higher than minimum wage. My brother Tom, who, I, as I talked about earlier, is the municipal judge here in the city. And uh, his TV program is the most watched of any cable program here in Sun Prairie. And he just had court this morning. And uh, there were seven cases that involved shoplifting at Woodman's. So there's a very aggressive approach to shoplifting, as there should be. Stealing is wrong, and it should be uh, dealt with with a firm hand. And if you're picked up for shoplifting, the fine is 170, I believe $177. So uh, just a point of interest is that uh, those jobs that are coming to Sun Prairie are very important to our economy, and we also have good employers such as Woodman's and Costco soon to be as well as all of our small businesses up and down Main Street that create jobs and give us the ability to buy things. So jobs in the economy are absolutely crucial to the success of this city and my district in general. The third area of, of concerns that I have, priorities, if you will, is health care. Now, health care is something that I believe every person in this state, in this country, should have a right to. I believe that if you get sick, you should have the ability to get basic medical care in the state of Wisconsin. Unfortunately, that's not true right now. And I would like to see that changed. In the previous administration, 98% of the citizens of Wisconsin were able to get health care. Every child in the state had health care. That's no longer true. Badger care has been cut. I know for most of you, health care is not a big issue because you're so healthy and you don't worry about getting sick and you don't worry about you know, any diseases. But there'll come a time when, when, as you get older, you're not as invincible 
as you are today. I remember when I was your age, and uh, I was invincible. Nothing could take me down, and you feel the same way. But health insurance, trust me, is a crucial part of your uh, life, and you need to have that in order to, to be successful. There's a lot of families in this state that live paycheck to paycheck because of the economy, and there's a lot of families that do not have health insurance. So if they were to get sick, they got a contracted disease, or have an accident, they could go through bankruptcy very easily. In Wisconsin, one of the main, course, uh, main uh, causes of bankruptcy is health care, health costs. It's just too expensive for people to cover their care. The final area, well, actually, there's two areas. One, one additional area is environment. Any campers in here? Any hunters? Any people like to hike in the woods? Like to fish, go on the lake, water ski? Yeah, I like to do all those. And Wisconsin, the number two interest industry in Wisconsin is tourism. We get a lot of our dollars into this state from tourists. And the reason they come here is they come for the cheese and the beer and the brats. But they really come here mainly because of the beautiful, pristine environment we have, both here in, in Dane County and also up north and all over the state. We have very clean water, very clean air. Our, our land is, is uh, pristine. And we as stewards of that property have an obligation to maintain that environmental cleanliness. There's been issues that have come up, such as the mine, the mining uh, idea up in northern Wisconsin, which would have created jobs. But unfortunately, the mining bill was drafted not by legislators. It was drafted by the mining company to dictate what our environmental laws would be. Now, I am very much in support of jobs and get creating jobs, but I'm never going to trade our environment for the short-term uh, job creation that we may get. Because I want, this, you know, the, the environment and job creation can work together, and that really is the best way for us to create jobs here in the state of Wisconsin. The final area that I really had a lot of emphasis on, especially this last term, dealt with clean government. It's very important for me that in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin has got a tradition, a wonderful tradition of clean, ethical government. Unfortunately, we've had some lapses in our government process in recent history where we've had uh, things go on in our government that are not transparent. You as citizens are my boss. I report to you. You've got an issue, you've got a problem. It's my job as your representative to do everything I can to resolve your issue. Now I get some goofy people that have some pretty crazy issues. And a lot of times, there's nothing that I can do to solve their problem because frankly, sometimes they're in the wrong. They've created their own problems. But most of the time, when I have a constituent who has a complaint, a problem, a concern, there, it's a legitimate one that they're being rebuffed by a state agency or by an employee who doesn't give them the time of day. And that's my job to get that problem resolved. Just a couple of days ago, I had a woman come in. Her daughter is uh, married to a fellow over in China. Just had a baby. Her first, this woman's first grandchild and they wanted to come to the United States. The, the daughter is a uh, US citizen. Her husband is a Chinese citizen. And they were getting a visa, but they couldn't get it processed. The, the government was not processing her visa. Well, they were planning for a big event. I think it was her 30th birthday back here in Wisconsin, back here in Dane County. And we were able to get that visa with one call to the representative's office in Madison, they immediately jumped on it, contacted the uh, uh, government agency that's responsible for visas, and that 
girl and her husband and their grandchild will be here next Friday. Now, I'm not saying that's anything special that I did. I'm just saying that that's my job. And there's times that people run into a roadblock that they can't get over. And that's one of the most important jobs I have is protecting my constituency and the issues that they have. I do everything I can to resolve those issues. So those are the big, uh, also well, dealing with clean government, I've also dealt with, in the legislature, we can pass laws that deal with the administration of the Supreme Court. Right now, we have some serious concerns, ethically, with what's going on in the Supreme Court. We have uh, judges on the Supreme Court that have received free legal advice from attorneys and law firms that appear before the Supreme Court and argue cases. And it's my position that if there is a judge who receives $100,000 or more in free legal advice from an attorney that's arguing a case in front of that judge, I think that judge has a bias. And I think that judge should recuse themselves, take themselves off the case. How can they possibly is that rain or air? Rain? Good. Cool. That reminds me of the first play I saw on Broadway was in Chicago. It was the play Cats. Anybody ever see the play Cats? It's a tremendous play. Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote the music, and it's just uh, beautiful music. Well, anyway, during the play, when... Uh, Methopolis was going around. It rained, and it was a, it was a perfect sound effect. So, anyway, um, going back to the judge, the judges, recusal is something I think is absolutely crucial. Right now, the rule is is that a judge, Supreme Court just judge, can in his own mind, it's subjective. Do I think I can I decide a case, even though there's somebody who has a special interest that I've dealt with? Can I decide that case? And if the judge says, I can still be independent, he can make a decision on that case. I think that really plays very poorly with the impression that we have as citizens that the Supreme Court is an independent body. So uh, that's one area that I've been working on. I've also been working on uh, making all of our meetings open. Because I think Wisconsin, when you deal with, with public employees, when you deal with representatives that are elected, the work that I do should be done in the open, not in closed uh, session. So I've been working on clean government. And Wisconsin has a history of being a state with very squeaky clean government. That corruption does not exist. And we need to maintain that reputation. We owe that to our citizens that we do that. Um, I can tell you about how a law is passed, but I told that to the four, when you were in fourth grade. And unless you have specific questions about that, basically we vote on the assembly, we have to have a majority, and then the Senate has to vote on it, has to have a majority for a new bill, and then the government, governor signs the bill. If the governor decides not to sign it, then the assembly and the, the uh, Senate have to have a two-thirds vote to override a veto. It's rare that that occurs, but that's how a law becomes a law in Wisconsin. And uh, I've uh, authored many laws. I've been co-sponsors on, on many, many laws that came into play. Uh, one of my, uh, I have a bunch of them, but one was the, uh, I had a law that provided funding for uh, uh, victims of the, the tornado that hit uh, Stoughton. And there was a huge amount of damage that the local governments had to pay. And there was no funding at the state level to reimburse the local communities and I was able to get a bill passed that provided that emergency funding for the local communities. That was Pleasant Springs and the, the uh, city of, uh, of Stoughton. Uh, my big emphasis with Sun Prairie is to make sure that we maintain the quality of education, the quality of our environment. We do everything we can to create jobs. I look to get uh, tax credits for companies that are looking to expand and creating jobs in the state. Uh, I will do whatever I can 
uh, to assist companies, uh, small businesses, uh, to expand their workforce. So that's pretty much uh, my description of the uh, my work in the assembly. Uh, I can go through a few questions, but before I do that, why don't I just uh, open it up to you and, and see if there's any questions you might have about my life or my, my work in the assembly. Anybody have a question? Yes. How many kids do I have? I have three children. Uh, I have uh, Andy, Matt, and Jenny. And uh, they grow up so fast. Uh, I also have one grandson. He's Lucas. My son Andy, who's a lawyer at the Boardman firm in Madison, uh, he went to study when he was in high school. He studied a year in... Uh, in Germany, and we told him when he went over there, please do not fall in love with a girl from Germany. It's too far away. So we followed our advice. He fell in love with a girl from Portugal. <laughs> and not only from Portugal, but from the islands in the Azores, which is 500 miles off the coast of Portugal. So needless to say, uh, uh, they got married and uh, they have a, a, a young son, Lucas, who's 10 months old. And uh, you can't relate to this yet, but someday you will. It's pretty cool. Uh, the three, actually the four greatest days of my life were the birth of my three children. And my wife tells me the most important was our wedding day. So I dasn't forget that. But Seeing a life come into the world is one of the neatest experiences I, I'll ever have. So that was pretty cool. Other questions? Is that three kids? Any other questions? Um, anybody else have a question? Yes. Never. Never. I mean, I just, I, I pinch myself with, I mean, I got, a ca I got an office. I have an office in the Capitol. I mean, I literally have a key, and they call it a fob, so I can go into the Capitol. The coolest building in the whole state, I can go into that building any time I want to go in. And I have my own office there. I've got a staff there. The coolest thing about my job, and you've gone up there with me, is to go to the top of the Capitol. Now, I'm scared to death of heights. I, I, when I was a kid, and we're, we're Catholic, and I grew up in a Catholic family, we'd go to all pile in the car, and literally it was one car, but we, it wasn't 17, because if you do the, the math, you only have, you know, like from 0 to 18 at home. So the age spread is about 23. The oldest is Frank. He was born uh, January 29th of 1939, and... Uh, Jackie, my baby sister, she was born on August 8th of 1962. So the age spread is 23 years. So basically, at any point in time, there was probably 10, maybe 11 in the household. But we'd pile in the car, go to Holy Hill, which is this church over by Mapleton, over in the east part of the state, by Milwaukee. And they have this huge, these huge steeples on the top of this huge Mountain, a hill. And uh, we would go up there, and you'd go up to the, uh, the bell towers, and OSHA did not have any restrictions on this, uh, this church. So you'd go up there, and the wind would be howling. But the worst thing you would ever do is, as a sibling in our family is act like you were scared because you would be made fun of. Yeah, kids are kids, you know, so... But that, we'd go up there, and I would be... When I came down, I was so happy to be back down, but I never showed that I was scared. But the point of that is that as I got older, I never got over the fear of heights. So I've been up to the top of the Capitol like 31 times in the last eight years. That's one of the neatest things I get to do because people go up with me and uh, oh, it is, it's, it's really neat. You've got to be 18 to do it. But uh, someday, some of you are 18. How many are 18? Anybody 18 yet? Okay. When you're 18, give my office a call. And we'll see what we can do to get you up there. Because I'm going to go up again on Friday uh, to do that. So that's, you say about, did I ever think I'd be here? Well, that's the whole thing about uh, 
I mean, I never thought, you know, when I was in high school, my guidance counselor here at Sunfire High School was Tom Tate, Tate's Trees. Really a nice guy. But he said, you know what? You ought to go to technical school because you just don't have the tools to get to go to college. Well, I'm one of those people that just tell me I can't do it. And I'm going to give it a try. And so that's what I did. And I went to college, and uh, I had to pay for it. And frankly, if I wanted to get into the University of Wisconsin-Madison today, I would not be able to do that because of the requirements. My GPA was always right about 2.75. It was always a B minus C plus. I thought, well, I'll, do as, I'll work as hard as I can, as hard as I need to, to get about a B average. I was not a really good student, but uh, when somebody tells you you can't do something, and my older brothers, who I thought if they can do it, I can do it, that's why being the oldest person in a family is extremely important because you are the role model for every one of your siblings. They look to you, and what they'll say, they won't have to tell you, but what, in their own mind they're thinking, well, if my brother John can do that, I, not only can I do it, but I can do it better. So you set the example in your family. So if you're a failure, it's more likely your siblings are going to be a failure as well. If you're a success, not only will they be generally successful, they may be more successful than you. My youngest brother, Joe, just to give you an example, my youngest brother, Joe, went to school here. Actually, he did not graduate from here. He graduated from Exeter Academy, uh, the same prep school out east in Exeter, New Hampshire, that uh, John Kennedy went to. His classmates were uh, in college. He went to Harvard undergraduate school. He was a classmate of Yo-Yo Ma, one of the most famous cellists. A lot of other famous people in his class. We went to his graduation at Harvard. The guest speakers, class speakers, you probably don't know Rodney Dangerfield, but Rodney Dangerfield was one of them, a uh, very famous comedian. And the other person was Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who wrote the Gulag Archipelago, real famous author. I mean, world-renowned. And we're in the same, uh, same place with him. Joe went on to get his law degree from Georgetown, and then he got a medical degree from the University of Cincinnati. So he's a doctor and a lawyer. He practices medicine up in Eau Claire. The point of the story is, is that he was the last one. He said, if Gary can be a lawyer, not only can I be a lawyer, I can be a lawyer and a doctor, and I can go to better schools. So the point is, is that, that competition can be good, and it makes you a better person. So, did that answer your question? Good. Some of my hobbies, I love uh, any day that starts with uh, flying. I'm a pilot. You remember that fear of flying I was telling you about? Well, it doesn't apply when you're inside a capsule. So if you're inside a plane, the height doesn't really bother me, and it doesn't usually bother you as well. There's that security of knowing you're in a capsule. So I love to fly a little Cessna. And I've taken up about 350 kids because there's this Young Eagles program. It gets kids, it gives them an experience of flying in a little airplane to see what it's like. Just yesterday, I took up two young ladies from Korea, from Seoul. And they're like 20. There at the, uh, up at the uh, square, there's a uh, uh, English as a Second Language Institute that they're going to. They're here for a couple of months. And my second son, Matt, is fluent in Korean because he spent two years teaching English at the university in Seoul, South Korea. And so he met these girls, and they wanted to go fly in an airplane. In Korea, they don't have general aviation. They don't have small planes. So, I mean, these girls experienced something that they would never be able to experience in Korea. But you know who had the best day? Was me. 
because I got to do something I love to do. I also love to run, although I've really slowed down. Um, I've run five marathons. Um, there's some people, like there's a Greta Waits, Greta Bates, who is a uh, famous runner who just passed away. But I ran right next to her at the New York Marathon back in 1980. And the only time I really saw her was at the start of the race. She was next to me. And then it was a blur after that. She won. She's won the women's in the New York Marathon probably 10 or 12 times. She was a great, phenomenal athlete. Uh, that is a, a neat experience to, uh, to run a marathon. When I was in high school, I thought the uh, athletes that were in track or cross country, well, they couldn't do anything else. So we kind of, but I found out how important it is. The mental part of running is very, very important. I was the um, high school quarterback here at Sun Prairie back in 1969. And um, that was uh, a neat experience. Uh, but what really was good for me is I couldn't, didn't pass very well. I was left-handed. I'm still left-handed. I will always be left-handed. And uh, I didn't pass the ball very well. But we had the best running back in the conference, Rick House who still lives in the community, but he was a leading scorer in the conference as a sophomore. So when you have a good runner, it makes a quarterback look good. But uh, high school is, really, is, is a tough part of your life. High school is, uh, there's a lot of fun things that go on, but there's also, it's a time when you grow and you have to, in your own mind, evaluate where you want to go with your life. Most of you have no idea and it took me until I was a senior in college before I knew I was going to go to law school. And the only reason that I decided to go to law school, well, one of the only reasons, my brother Tom was also going to law school. That's probably the bigger reason. But the Vietnam War was going on. And it was a very unpopular war. And we had a draft in the nation where you they drew numbers based on your birthday. And so my number was 208 out of 365. And it, basically the draft said if you were over 180, it was unlikely you'd get drafted. But if you were below 180, there was a very good chance you'd get drafted. You would have to serve in the military, and most likely, better than 50-50 chance, you would go to Vietnam. Unless you were a student, there was a 2S exemption. If you were a student, you didn't have to be drafted. You didn't have to go to Vietnam. Well, that was an easy out for me. I'm not that big on fighting anyway. People ask me, why did I become a lawyer? When you grow up in a family of 17, it really gets, after a while, you don't like to fight physically, beat up in each other. And what you end up doing is you have to negotiate. You want something, your brother wants something, your sister wants something, you negotiate. Well, that's just what a lawyer does. So it was right up my alley that I could be a lawyer and negotiate. And the reason I went to law school as a, uh, during the Vietnam War as I maintained the 2S deferment. And frankly, if it wasn't for that, I probably would not have become a lawyer. But it was one of the best things I ever did because I love practicing law. One of my first days when I was in the law office, a guy, we, Tom and I were setting up our law office, and a fellow came and looked like a new client, and we were desperate for clients. So I picked up the phone and I said, oh, hello, yes, you want a new, you need an attorney? Uh, sure, I'll be glad to represent you, but I need a $10,000 retainer because your case is very, very significant. I said, okay, yes, you can come in at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye, and I hung up the phone. And then this, I said to the guy who just talked, he says, can I help you? He says, yeah, I'm the telephone man. I just came here to hook up your phone. So it didn't work. But I tried. Anyway, uh, we have a lot, of, uh, a lot of neat stories in the law practice. And being a lawyer is one of the neatest experiences because for the first time in my life, I got paid from people who were asking me questions. My, what I told them was worth money. I mean, can you imagine you're talking to your friend and they'll pay you for what you say? That's pretty cool. So as time goes on, I get paid for my advice. So being a lawyer is a, uh, 
a neat experience. But it's also one that requires a lot of responsibility because you've got to be right in the advice that you give. If you're wrong, it can create a lot of problems for you. Now, I have a list of questions that I'll look at. How are we doing on time? Zip. I got 10 after 2. Is that close to uh, where we want to be? No other questions from you guys. That's me. No other questions. Yes. I knew you had one. You mean in the um, in the legislature or at the uh, at the law office or, or both? Basically, I'm here because of the legislature. Uh, is there so, yeah? There's projects that I'm working on all the time, uh, and probably the one that I'm most interested in right now is clean government, getting us back to where we need to be, where people respect the legislators, where we work in in the legislature. We talk with each other. I think the biggest responsibility a legislature a legislator I have is to listen. I don't learn anything when I talk, because I'm just spouting off what I know. But when I really learn is when I listen. To give you an example of that, we had a very tumultuous uh, year and a half. And if you're living under a rock, you wouldn't know that. But we've had protests in Madison for the last uh, year and a half. And I was, I was part of that. And one of the things that really distressed me was that there was a Act, Act 10 dealt with um, eliminating public unions and the ability to, for public unions to, to um, uh, bargain uh, on their job conditions. And we had a, a committee listens to testimony before we pass a bill. Well, the committee for this bill on Act 10 listened to a testimony for, oh, I suppose maybe eight hours. Well, there were still literally hundreds of people that wanted to testify as to how this new law would affect them. So what we did is, we're in the minority, what we did is we said, we're gonna keep these hearings going. And we're not only gonna keep them going for eight hours a day, we're gonna run 24 hours a day. We did that for 140 straight hours. 140 straight hours, and I did over 40 of those hours. We took testimony from over 18,000 people about how Act 10 would affect them. Basically, cuts to teaching, cuts to education uh, across the board, loss of bargaining rights that, that unions have. 18,000 people. Just to give you one example, uh, and you, they would tell you, I mean, these are teachers, uh, firemen, uh, police officers, state workers, how it was going to devastate them. One, uh, we were going, it was a Sunday night, I remember this vividly. Sunday night, I started at about six o'clock. These people were there just sitting, about 10 o'clock, this uh, fellow got up to testify. His wife and daughter also testified that they were, the, how the uh, collective bargaining bill would hurt them. But about 10, this guy had waited about four and a half hours to testify. He started testifying, and he says, you know, I'm a pilot for commercial airlines. Cool, something I always wanted to be. Uh, and the, what this has done, what this bill will do, will destroy the abilities of unions to get the types of benefits, the pay, the, the working conditions that they need to have. And I said, I asked him questions about his, you know, his experience as a pilot. And he said, the reason that flying is safe is because unions hire quality people to take care of all the issues that are involved in flying. I happen to be a pilot for an airline, and I was in the plane that landed on the Hudson River. So Jeff Skiles, who lives in Oregon, the co-pilot with Sully Sullivan of the plane that landed on the Hudson River, not one life was lost. He was testifying in front of us about how important this legislation was to him 
and to the citizens of Wisconsin. And the shame about Act 10, and the governor himself admits that he did it, he should have been more open with what his plans were. But the shame about Act 10, it was such an all-encompassing law, but there was the attempt to get it passed before the public was aware of what it included. So, uh, I mean, that to me was such an, it's somebody who would take his time. A hero, a real hero in our society. Imagine, as a pilot, my training told me that if you ever hit water, it's like hitting cement. You'll never walk away from a plane crash that hits water. And if any of you have seen the video of it, it is just amazing. I mean, the plane's floating on the Hudson River with like 160 people on its wings. And the ferry boats are coming to take the people off. So that was a, it was a neat experience to go through that. But the key for me as a good legislator is to make sure that I'm always willing to listen. Any other questions? Where is that list of mine? Least favorite thing. Oh, my least favorite thing would be, um, I happen to be in the minority. My least favorite thing is when the other side of the aisle, when we talk about you know, one side, for instance, this side is the Democrat, this side is the Republican side. That's how we're divided in the legislature, by political parties. So when we are talking about a bill on the floor, we're making arguments for why we should uh, pass it or why we should vote it down. And we're also dealing with amendments. One of the most frustrating things for me was that I have a lot of friends on the other side of the aisle. And during this last session, I would come up with amendments to bills that they had, and they would say to me, you know, that's a really good idea, but I can't vote for it because if I do, I will be threatened with the primary. In other words, my party will have someone run against me, so I can't even talk about the issue on the floor. Now, that's not how democracy works. In order for democracy to work, you have to feel free to discuss an issue and be open-minded about changes that make it better. That's the worst thing about my job, is when I've got a good idea, I want others to listen, and frankly, I will always listen to other ideas. I don't care which party passes a law, what I care about is that the citizens of Wisconsin are protected and the law makes their life better. Thank you all very much. Have a good year, high school. You guys got good seats. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to see your tickets. How you doing? Good. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. How you doing? Good.